Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. In this season, we are exploring the question, who am I? And today you're gonna to hear a wonderful message from our own Pastor Doug about the fact that we were made for meaningful relationships. Part of what gives us life is connecting. And so I would love the chance to connect with you and get to know you. So if you would take a moment and click the link that is in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here, that you're worshiping with us, and let us know how we can be in prayer for you. Now I invite you to take a big, deep breath, and let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me now as we go before God in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be found on your screen. Let's pray now together. Creator God, you hear our wordless hopes, hold our greatest fears, and know our deepest shame. Nothing we say, do, or think surprises you because you made us and know us more intimately than we know ourselves. As we seek to understand ourselves, give us courage knowing that your love for us will never be called into question. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello Church, my name is Eun Siu Gang, I'm one of the associate pastors here. It is my great joy to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, from the very beginning, you blessed creation. You have loved and shielded your people through all joys and trials of life. As we gather in worship today, we come before you with grateful heart. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. Lord, as we come together, we are reminded of the profound truth that we were not designed to be alone. And in your wisdom, you created companionship and relationships to fulfill our lives. We were created to love and support one another and to walk together on this journey of life. We thank you for the gift of family, friends, colleagues, and community. We thank you for the companions and helpers you have placed in our lives. Help us to recognize that we are interconnected 
and our lives are enriched through the relationship in you. May we be instrument of your love and care, offering a helping hand to those who need it. Help us to be aware of those around us who may be in need of love and support and grant us the grace and compassion to reach out to them. We lift up to you, O Lord, all those who may be feeling lonely or isolated. We pray that your comforting presence may cover them, reminding them that they are never truly alone because you are always with them. We ask your peace for those who are in times of difficulty and sorrow, especially for Israel and Gaza. We offer our prayers for each other. So now we especially pray for these whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your strength and comfort. Touch their lives and souls with your warm hands. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gifts. As we respond to God's generosity and grace, I'd like to remind you that you can contribute to the ministry of Riceville United Methodist Church through our smartphone apps, website, or via mail. Let us continue to worship God. I'm Pastor Eun Seo. I'm so excited to share this time with you. Today, I have got some fun pictures. Would you like to see them together? Hey, so here it is. Do you know where it is? Yes, playground, right. And the next one is, do you know where it is? Wow, we look so fun. Here is Flip and Fly. And the last one, do you know where it is? Yes, here is Jungle Rapids. I have been there yet and really want to go there this summer. Well, so these pictures show places where we have fun. The places where we want to go and we want to play. So I have a question. When do you play at these places? Do you have more fun playing alone or playing with friends? Yes, it is more enjoyable and exciting to play with your friends than playing alone. And also, we can try lots of games or activities when we are with friends. So isn't it so cool to have friends and play with our friends? So today we have a fantastic story from the Bible to remind us how important friends are. So in the book of Genesis chapter two, it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Do you know what that means? It means God saw that Adam, who was the first person made by God, was all alone. So God thought, hmm, 
it is not good for him to be alone. He needs a friend. He needs someone to be with him. And that is when God made his friend Eve. So that reminds us we were not made to live completely by ourselves. We were meant to have friends in our lives. Just like Adam needed a friend, we all need friends too, so we don't feel lonely. Well, I moved here last year, and at the time, I didn't have any friends here. And Pastor Julia became my friend, and now she is my best friend. So today, I want you to think about how you can be a good friend to others. Well, it could be sharing your snacks, playing a game together, or just simply listening carefully what they say. Um, sharing our friendship with others would make us even happier. So let us share our friendship and let us be a good friends to others. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for giving us good friends. Help us to be a good friend to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Riceville United Methodist Church, and I'm really glad that you decided to spend a little time on the vine today. Uh, we're continuing our series entitled, Who Am I? And we're asking the questions, not only who am I, but uh, where do I belong and what is my purpose? And we're continuing on in Genesis chapter 2, uh, around the creation stories to see what God had intended from the beginning. So we're in chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And uh, the author says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal in the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living thing, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, um, we thank you for creating us. Not just all of us, but I mean each one of us. You did that individually. Thinking about each of us when you created us. We're humbled that you would think that you needed one of us to be here. Lord, we thank you also for our relationships, for those around us who build us up and support us and love us and who we love in return. And we ask a blessing upon us all. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I've never in my life considered this story to be funny or comical until I started studying it again for this week's sermon. We're still in chapter 2 of Genesis, and we get to verse 18, and God says, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. Now, what you would expect to come next is verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and as he slept, God took one of his ribs, and with the rib he made a woman and brought her to the man. Cool story except we're leaving two verses out of it. After God says it isn't good for the man to be alone, he does not immediately cause the man to go to sleep. Instead, God makes all the animals 
and allows the man to name them all. And in verse 20, it says, but for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. Is anyone else seeing this as funny? I'm imagining God telling Adam, hey, I'm going to give you a partner to be a suitable helper. How about this animal? What do you want to call it? I think I'll call it a dog, says Adam. Great, says God. Would that be a suitable helper? Well, it makes for a great friend. I'm not sure it's a suitable helper, says Adam. And so they move on to the next animal. How about this one? It can fly. What do you want to call it? Adam says, I think I'll call it a bird. Will that be a suitable helper? Adam thinks, well, it's really cool, but it isn't a suitable helper. So one by one, they go through all the animals, the giraffe, the elephant, the rhinoceros, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, nothing is suitable. And finally, God says, I've got it. And we move on to verse 21 and 22, where God takes the rib and creates the first woman. As the note says on the bottom of the page of my study Bible, to be fully human, one needs to be in relation to others who correspond to oneself. The helper is not a relationship of subordination, but of mutuality and interdependence. God took a part of Adam to make the woman. And to be sure that we understand that the helper is never to be seen as something less than the man, throughout the rest of the Bible, the word used here as helper is actually most often used to describe the Lord God Almighty. So there we are. There's the Lord and there's two of us. And since that time, despite many challenges, we seem to have flourished as a species to where there are now about 8 billion people living on this planet we call Earth. But back to the story. Compared to Genesis 1, Genesis 2 is far less concerned with the creative order and far more concerned with the creation of relationships. The relationship between other earthly creatures and human beings, the relationship between men and women, and the relationship between God and humanity. But in our reading for this morning, it's interesting to note that we have the first negative statement in all the creation stories. And it goes like this. It is not good for the man to be alone. The God of the universe, the God of all creation, the one who has declared everything that he made as good, identifies with this sad singularity that he's now created a single lone Adam. Long before the introduction of sin into the world, God who filled the world with, with light and life and color and warmth identifies aloneness as a not good thing for all times and all places. So a new type of creation must occur so that this situation can be rectified. If this work had been recorded in Genesis 1, we might have been left with, and on the eighth day, God created relationships, for they are critical. This story tells why people are social creatures. Our social connections are important for our very survival. Our relationships with family, friends, co-workers, and community members can have a major impact on our health and well-being. When people are socially connected and have stable and supportive relationships, they're more likely to make healthy choices and to have better mental and physical health outcomes. They're also better able to cope with hard times, with stress, anxiety, and depression. On the flip side, it's important to note that loneliness is a feeling of being alone, regardless of the amount of social contact a person has. Social isolation can certainly lead to loneliness in some people, while others can feel lonely in the middle of a crowd. It's about the quality of the connections. I'll just speak from my own experience. I know more people than I've ever known in my life. I'm the pastor of a 2,600-member church have 1,600 friends on Facebook, but I'm not sure I have as many good friends as I had when I was back in high school. And many of the good friends that I do have live in faraway places. I wonder if the same thing can be said for you in your life. How can we be more connected than ever and yet have fewer strong relationships? It's a mixed up, muddled up, shook up world for sure. And it's becoming a problem. A report from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine states there's strong evidence that many adults are socially isolated or lonely in ways that are putting their health at risk. 
Recent studies found that social isolation significantly increases a person's risk of premature death from all causes, a risk that may rival smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. Loneliness is as bad as those things. Social isolation is associated with about a 50% increased risk of dementia. Poor social relationships is associated with a 29% increased risk of heart disease and 32% increased risk of stroke. Probably less surprising, loneliness is also associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And loneliness among heart failure patients was associated with a nearly four times increased risk of death, 68% increased risk of hospitalization, and 57% increased risk of emergency department visits. Truly, it is not good for a man or woman to be alone. And yet, I love those shows where they plop somebody down in Alaska or Patagonia or the Amazon rainforest and expect people to survive by their own wits. I guess Survivor is the most famous of these reality shows that have nothing to do with reality. But there is one that is harder than all the others. It is called Alone, and it can be found on the History Channel. In this one, you guessed it, you have to put your survival skills to the test by yourself. You are given 10 tools to take with you into the wilderness. And then, good luck. Now, most people tap out in, about, in just a few days. But in 10 seasons, the longest anyone has ever made it is 100 days. And he was someone who had dedicated his life to wilderness survival. The second longest stay on the show was 89 days. This contestant had to be pulled off the show because she was suffering from frostbite. The third longest stay was 87 days. In less than three months, that contestant lost 70 pounds. We're talking days, not years. Clearly, we are not meant to be alone. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs a spouse, a significant other, or even a roommate, but we do need other people in our life, and particularly meaningful relationships. Since the very beginning of time, uh, we have gathered together as a species. We met to feel safe from wild animals, to share resources such as food, tools, shelter, and warmth. We met to find mates and companionship. Good, healthy relationships are ones where we treat each other as co-equals, as suitable helpers, rather than subordinates that we look down upon or take advantage of. As usual, Jesus shows us the meaning of all this. In John 15, Jesus tells the disciples some important truths. He says, I no longer call you servants. Instead, I call you friends. This is an incredible realization. Jesus considers you his friend. Do you consider Jesus your friend? I mean, he'd be a good friend to have. It reminds me of hymn number 526 in the hymnal, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It was written back in 1855 by Joseph Scriven. He just immigrated to Canada from Ireland due to the potato famine. And right after he moved to this side of the Atlantic, he got word that his mom died. He wrote the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus to comfort his family members back home in Ireland in their time of intense struggle and grief. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer, he writes. Yes, Jesus is a good friend to have. And if Jesus is your friend, then, well, you ought to hang out together. You should join in on what he's up to in the world. And that includes connecting with some of Jesus' other friends. Which leads me to one of my favorite quotes from John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. He writes, Solitary religion is not to be found in the New Testament. Holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Faith working by love is the length and breadth and depth of the height of Christian perfection. Holiness is social because God is social. He created human beings in his image to be relational creatures. We become fully human when we share in the relationships that God initiates through the people that he places along our way. 
And social holiness is the practice of obeying Jesus' commands to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourself. When Wesley says that holiness is social, he means that the depth of our love for God is revealed in the way we love God's people. Here's a secret. That's everybody. After all, Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, and then he says to love our enemies. Guess I gotta love everybody. The writer of 1 John describes the social nature of holiness this way. He says, we love because God first loved us. Those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they've seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. If we truly love God, then we must love the people God places alongside us at church, in our neighborhood, city, and even around the world. We need community, what Wesley calls society, for grace to nurture us into the people that God created us to be. One of the ways we acknowledge this is through the activity that we're about to participate in. Now, sure, eating bread and drinking juice may seem to outsiders like an odd ritual, but it's an important sign of our life together as disciples of Jesus Christ. The Reverend Taylor Burton Edwards, the former director of worship resources with Discipleship Ministries of the United Methodist Church, he puts it this way. He says, what we're doing in Holy Communion is a double thing. When we receive the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, we are remembering. At the same time, we're also remembered, put back together again. We pray that we may be one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. God's work of making us one and uniting us with Christ, with each other, and in our witness and life in the world, this is the ordinary way by which God feeds us, sustains us, and empowers us to live as Christians in the world around us. It's bringing us back to the center so we can go out again. This is who we are. This is what we do. So let's not take our relationships for granted. And let's love others like God loves us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, Lord, it's amazing. The people that you have put in our lives, the people that have loved us from our birth, the ones who love us now, or the ones who continue to sustain us in ways that we don't even tend to acknowledge, but they give us hope and inspiration and joy sometimes challenge. And that's okay too, because it helps us to grow and to see how other people live in their lives. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be good members of the community that you have put us in, and that we will learn to love like you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our service will continue with Holy Communion, and so we invite you to get a piece of bread and some liquid so that you might consume the elements uh, with us. And so if you don't have those, why don't you hit pause on the video, go ahead and get those things together, and come back and join us. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another, praying together. Merciful, Merciful God, we confess, confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to continue to pray in silence.
Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the, In the name, name of, of Jesus Christ, Christ you, you are, are forgiven. forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for us. This is the blood of Christ, shed for us. You're invited now to consume the elements that you have in your home. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world and the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go forth in peace. And may you live at peace with others, helping to improve their lives and helping to allow them to improve yours. Love, like God has first loved you.